Okay, let's try now. Ah, okay, perfect. In fact, we could probably do with a little bit uh, less volume because I'm well known for being a yelling guy. I'm a Mediterranean guy, as most of you. I'm from Spain. Okay, my name is Angel. We pronounce it that way. I know you pronounce it quite differently. Um, and yes, we Mediterraneans, we love to argue, and we love to discuss, and we love to yell. We are loud people. Well, I'm loud even for a Spaniard, okay? The people in Spain are like, eh, dude, can you turn it down a little bit? So that's the reason most of the time I always get like, like the last slot in the conference, okay? It's 5 p.m., it's been a very, very long day. Now it's time for the crazy loud Spaniard. He will keep them awake, okay? Okay, I get it, I understand it. <laughs> that's my role in the conference. So, welcome, my name is Angel, I'm from Emilia, I come from Spain. These slides will be available on SlideShare, uh, if not today, tomorrow morning, first thing. And the reason I'm telling you that is, is because I will try to give you a lot of resources, things that you can use on Monday on your companies, like, like books you can see, videos you can see, watch. Uh, uh, there's a lot of practices that I've been using at all my clients. And I have so many things I would like to talk about and so little time. So I will try to keep some of those here in the slides and you can consult them later. And they are available in the slide here for free. There's also my contact information and the Twitter handle. I love, you know, I have a hungry ego. My ego is imprisoned in a small cage just behind my stomach and I feed him with followers and, and likes and retweets and things like that. It's the only thing he gets these days. So it's very important to feed my hungry ego. There's my Twitter handle. Uh, who am I? Well, I consider myself someone that has been helping companies all around the world in the last 10 years in their agile transformations, improvement processes, improvement transformations. And I've been lucky enough to be working in, in places like uh, telecommunications, video games, mobile, uh, electronics, aerospace, military, medical, online tourism, government. And I've done that in several European countries and also in Latin America in some other places. Um, what I try to do is to tell you about the things that I've seen that work everywhere. i like, dude, try that, it's working like charm. And some things, like for instance, Vasco was talking about estimates, and I'm like, you know what? We all think that we suck at estimates. He's like, yeah, we are so bad. Which means that probably we believe that there's someone over there, somewhere, that is very good at estimating. And you know, I've traveled the world, I can't find them. <laughs> They're hiding really, really good. <laughs> it's like I'm trying to learn from someone how to do good estimates. And you know what? It's not working. So that's what I do. I try to figure out what's working, what's not working. Beyond certifications, uh, uh, frameworks, whatever the book says, I'm a pragmatic guy. So, my pleasure to be here. Uh, if anyone is curious on the drawings, I try to make them myself. I will talk about that later on also as part of my story and of what I call my vanity slides. So, let's start with a personal journey. This guy over here, that's me. It's not the guy who ate me, okay? It's <laughs> <laughs> this is the guy who ate Anton Medinilla. <laughs> No, that was me like 10 years, 8 years ago. I weighed 120 kilos. I was massive. I was huge. And one day I had like a revelation. And the revelation was, you're going to die. <laughs> and I was like, yeah, well, I know. Everyone dies. I'm like, no, you're going to die soon. <laughs> And that second part started to worry me because I was smoking one pack in a day, I was doing no exercise, I was eating like pizza, burgers, and you know, all this crap fast food. Um, I weighed a lot, the weight is also a, a, a risk factor, and I also had a lot of stress. I, I knew the taste of stress. I can talk to you about how stress tastes and how it feels and how your, your eyes can buzz, and how your jaw can get like really, really blocked, and this kind of pain that starts on your, on your, on your back and goes through your arms. And I started to worry, because every, you know, I have everything in the book for a heart attack. The only thing I can try on top of that was hard drugs. Uh, you know, is there's only one thing left in the book. I was gonna die. So I decided to start improving. I decided that I needed to change a lot of things in my life. And I dropped 40 kilos of weight. I'm still on my way. I want to lower it down some six to 10 kilos more, but I'm happy. I'm running health marathons every once in a while, and I'm a regular runner. I quit smoking uh, 11 years ago. Uh, I'm eating as healthy as I can. I have a difficult relationship with food, okay? <laughs> 
it's like, you know, these kind of lovers that they know that they are not good for each other, but the passion is so, you know, hot. <laughs> That's what happens to me when I see cake. You know, it's like, I know it's not good for me, but come here. <laughs> so I'm still trying to figure that out. Um, um, basically, I turned this idea of improving things and going into journeys and trying to mm, look for better states of being and being happier and healthier and more productive. And, you know, one of the things I did in order to bring down stress, I quit my company, I quit my job. I was a project manager for a big telecommunications company. And I went, you know, I'm going to be a freelancer, I'm going to make less money, but still, you know, I will be happier. Guess what? I'm probably making three times as much as I was doing when I was a project manager. And I'm happier. And I don't generate any more stress. How cool is that? I figured out, I started to see, you know, parallelisms between this personal journey and the things that I see in companies. You know, companies, uh, they like fast food. They like things that they know they're bad for them. Still, they doing, do them over and over and over and over. Like, for instance, in 1976, we had this guy, Fred Brooks, writing a book, The Medical Man Month. And in that book, he said, adding more software developers to a project that is delayed only contributes to delay even more. So what do you see in 2016? Oh, we are late. Let's bring more developers. <laughs> it happens every single day. Uh, also, when you say bring more developers, you have people that have been CTOs, CEOs in software companies for 20 years. They still believe that when you hire someone, he's like, hello, I'm Angel, I'm the new guy. Where's my computer? Oh, that's my computer. Bring them. <laughs> it doesn't go that way. It takes you like two months until you realize where are the restrooms, where do you get coffee, where do I ask for post-it notes? And, and, and you know, that makes it even worse. Or even you call your favorite supplier, you call, you know, the usual suspects, the consultancy companies, all that, and you're like, I need 200 front-end Java developers by tomorrow. What? You know, CEOs, CEOs, a lot of managers in a lot of companies, they think that life is like a, a, this science fiction movie, I, Robot, where they have all these robots hanging on containers. And then you are like, yeah, I need 200 developers, and they activate the developers. Me, 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 me. And you got 200 new developers by tomorrow. It doesn't work that way, we all know it. And still the companies are in these bad habits that are making them miserable and are killing companies. So I decided that's what I wanted to do for a living. I wanted to help companies to improve. And you know, improvement in Agile means retrospectives, okay? So there's this magic, magnificent practice where every two weeks we try to figure out what went really, really well and we have to keep doing and what impediments did we face, how can we fix them? Retrospectives, now we see them as something natural, but you know, I was a PMI guy some 20 years ago, okay? I've been there, <laughs> I've done that shit, okay? <laughs> and I remember the times where instead of doing project retrospectives every two weeks, you know what we had? Anything remembers what we had before retrospectives? Uh, lessons learned, best practices. When did you write that? At the end of a project. Okay, there was this thing called the project post mortem. Okay, so something exploded, killed five million people. Let's try to figure out what can we do differently next time. I'm like, ah, too late. <laughs> okay. So it was great. We discovered this retrospective thing that was happening in two weeks. So it, it allowed us to detect impediments earlier in the process. And that was brilliant. But guess what? I realized that retrospectives were broken. I started going consultant for a, long, a lot of companies around the world. And I saw a lot of patterns on how retrospecti retrospectives were failing. Like, for instance, my favorite, the Groundhog Day retrospective. You remember this movie by Bill Murray, where the Groundhog Day movie when he's living the same day over and over and over? Well, this is this retrospective where you list the same list of issues over and over and over. And then you're like, okay, so we're going to do the retrospective again. Yeah, we're going to do the retrospective again. So what happens? Uh, the project owner, the product owner is never available. Yeah, we know that. He's never been available for the past two years. So what's new now? No, but we have to do the retrospective. We have to put what's going wrong. What's going wrong is, oh, it takes a long to get development environments. Yeah, as always. Why are we doing this stuff? It's because now we are agile. Ah, I see, I see. <laughs> So people keep demotivated, and something that happens with human beings, when you start trying something and it doesn't work, you stop it. And, you know, then I started thinking about when I started running. When I started running, it was painful. I mean, running is amazing. 
You should run. You should feel the experience of running long distances and saying, wow, my body is an amazing machine that was made for this. Running is amazing. You should run. But never start running. Start running. That sucks. That's horrible. The first day you want to die. The second day is even worse. And you're like, this is going to get worse every single time I try. Oh my god. So you quit. And that's what people did with retrospectives. Because there's a lot of other uh, bad patterns, like anti-patterns on retrospectives. Like the playground retrospectives. OK, let's retrospect. Now, today, I've seen it. I'm, I'm, I'm going to tell a true story. I was in a scram gathering. I'm not going to say what, which one. But there was this group of grown adults, CEOs, CTOs of companies paying maybe $3,000, $5,000 for being there. And they were playing ball. And each time the ball dropped to the floor, everyone said, Yay! So they learned how to celebrate failure. And I was like, what the? <laughs> because by now we are agile. And I'm like, dude, we have different ideas of what agile is about. Yeah, so the playground retrospective, everyone has like a good and great time. Next week, we do everything the same way. And then we play another game, and we draw, and we hug each other. That's what I also call should be yeah, yeah, the Kumbaya retrospective. Let's hold our hands and share our pain and pray to the goddess. Let's get rid of our clothes and dance under the moon. <laughs> because Agile is about happiness and love and trust and confidence and about software. No, 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 no software delivery. That's Taylorism. <laughs> we are about love. So I think that's an anti pattern. And then you have the whining retrospective. Everyone whines about how everything is wrong and bad. And then nobody does nothing about that. And then you have the artificial harmony retrospective. It's like, is there any problem? No. <laughs> you seem to be whining a lot yesterday. I can't remember. <laughs> what happened the other day? I don't know. I'm fine. No problem. <laughs> so we can get out of here as soon as possible. Huh? And you have, yeah, that's the no problem retrospective. Then you have the drill surgeon retrospective. Scrum master yelling at the team, no, you are doing everything wrong. You are not doing scrum. You are not doing pair programming. I'm going to kill you. I'm going to kill you twice. I'm going to kill you, then I'm going to resurrect you, and then I'm going to kill you again. <laughs> and everybody's like, oh my god. So yeah, that's also a very bad pattern. And then you have the, we don't understand the causes of whatever is happening. And there's more! <laughs> I'm not going to go over all of them, but I will give you some ideas of where you can read more about that. So what did I do? What did I do with retrospectives? I improved them. I improved them. I started thinking about why retrospectives were failing, which is a pattern I try to introduce in companies. Instead of how do you do retrospectives, try to think about your problems. What problem do we have? And then try to find solutions to that problem. Oh, but maybe that problem and that solution, they are not in the Scrum book. You know what? Screw the Scrum book! We are not here to do Scrum, we are here to solve our problems and to improve. And if Scrum is helping, yay, it's not helping, try something else. You're not paid, or you shouldn't be paid for doing Scrum. That's not the goal. I'm a Scrum guy, I'm doing Scrum in all my customers. That's, that, that's not the goal, that's something we do. Okay? So it's like plugging the computers into the wall, that's something we do, but it's not the goal, it's something that happens eventually. So I started figuring out that some of the problems were in the beginning of the retrospectives, like people don't prepare the retrospectives. Like when you arrive to the retrospectives, nobody takes the time to check in everyone and try to make everyone think about what they're doing here. Sometimes test the water. Sometimes it's like, now we fired five people, today is not the day to do a retrospective. Everyone is like super pissed off. I'm going to buy them some beers. I will try the retrospective thing next week. Like test the waters. Mm. Is today a good day to do a retrospective? Then I always start by trying to remember what happened in the last retrospective. Oh, we said we are going to buy some beers to have around. Did we do that? No. Why? Oh, we forgot. Then why should we do another retrospective? We are not done with the last one. We have a problem. We identify problems. We say we're going to do things. We don't do that. Let's fix that first before we start seeing other problems. So that's what I call remember. Remember we said we're going to buy some beer? Yes. Did we do that? Yes, or we tried and we failed. Okay, that's fine, but we tried, right? Okay, let's try something else, then we can go forward. But if you start a retrospective and nobody did a damn about the last retrospective, stop it there, quit, abort. And say, what's happening, dudes? We are playing solitaire and we are cheating. <laughs> you know, this is for us. <laughs> so then we have storytelling. People are so bad at storytelling. Storytelling is a very powerful in companies and storytelling is about tell me the story of the sprint. And I, you know, it's, it's happened to me a number of times. 
you get some people together and you're like, tell me the story of your last sprint. And they say, oh yeah, our problem is that our machines are very slow. And I'm like, that's not what I asked. I asked you to tell me the story of the last sprint. And then everyone goes quiet, like, oh, we did something wrong. We're going to get punished. <laughs> like, oh, tell me the story of the last sprint. And that's someone says, well, you know, I believe that if we have continuous integration, maybe things will be, and no, 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 that's not what I asked. Tell me the story of the sprint. And everyone goes quiet again. And I'm like, it goes like this. It was a rainy Monday morning when the product owners showed up with a lot of written stories that were, were nothing, were was well, nothing because nobody could understand them. So we spent the beginning of that rainy morning rewriting all the user stories with the product owner. And then we realized that the person that was the subject matter expert was not there. So we made a lot of questions to the product owner. Product owner, product owner, should we do steel water or sparkling water? And the product owner is like, I don't know. Tell me the story of the sprint. The problem is that we focus on the, the sprint delivery, something that happened like an hour ago, and we forget the whole situation, connecting the dots, Steve Jobs said. Try to tell the whole story. Storytelling is an amazing, powerful force. You know, I think it's Jason Friedel from 37 Signals, uh, the Basecamp guys, the Ruby and Rails guys. I think he's the one that has like a cardboard cat in their office. And he says, people come to me and they say, Jason, I have a problem. And I keep writing and I, and I tell them, have you told the cat yet? And they're like, eh, no, go tell the cat, then you tell me. And then he makes people sit in front of a cardboard cat and they start telling the story and he says, more than the majority of the cases, people start, I, I watch them and they are talking, talking, talking and then suddenly they stop and they do like this. Uh, and they stand up and they go. They realize something. Because they connect the dots. They tell the sprint story, the iteration story. And then they realize, oh my god, we have problems at the end. Because at the beginning, we couldn't figure out what we should do. Ah, oh, that's a problem. OK, that's very important. And then we go into the usual part of identifying good things, bad things. Then we start breaking them down. We try to prioritize. Many times the problem is that we have 75 billion fronts open. You cannot win all the battles. You have to select the battles. And then we do some root cause analysis, then we plan. What's the plan? Oh, the plan is we're getting a lot of interruptions. Well, that's not a plan, that's a problem. What's your plan against that problem? Oh, we are going to be more concentrated. We are going to be more focused. That's our plan. I'm like, yeah, how are you going to do that? Well, focus, from the dictionary word, focus to focus. <laughs> yeah, how are you actually going to be more focused? They're like, oh, well, we're going to close our fist and <laughs> That's not a plan. That's wishful thinking. It's not going to happen. <laughs> no, you know what, I could, what we're going to try? Because people keep interrupting us when we are highly concentrated. We're going to buy some yellow jackets, yellow chef safety jackets. We have eight people. We will buy six of those. And when you are very, very concentrated in something, you're going to take one of those jackets, and you're going to you know, wear that jacket. And it's going to be like in ninjas. You can't see me. <laughs> I'm a ninja. Don't talk to me. I'm not here. <laughs> And then there's two people that don't have jackets, and they are the ones that should handle the requests and the interruptions from other people in order to protect their colleagues. And we should probably have some rules, because if not, someone will say, uh, I will wear the jacket Monday morning, <laughs> and I will get it off Friday afternoon, perfect week. <laughs> no, you shouldn't do that. Okay, so let's, well, that's a plan. Who's going to buy the jackets? The scrum master. How's gonna, how is he going to pay for the jackets? We're all too going to chip in, or we're going to ask human resources for some money. Okay, that's the plan. Let's try. What are we going to do? Who's going to make it? When is he going to make it? How is he going to make it? You answer those four questions. I'm more confident that we're going to actually experiment something, try something, in order to maybe learn something. And then celebrate, because something that happens with retrospectives is that you start going into all the bad things and the bad things and the bad things, and then people leave the retrospective like super depressed. Dude, it sucks working here. And then you go for the weekend. <laughs> and then you are like munching on all those problems. So it's a very good idea to use kudos and good feedback and celebration and say thank you for things. And that also creates a culture of the team. What things do I appreciate? Hey, the other day was your birthday. You brought brownies. Every single day with brownies is a better day. OK, so congratulations for that and thank you. It's not only about development and the process. It's about this I like. This makes me happy. OK, so we learned that bringing brownies, good thing. Then 10 weeks later, we start noticing how we are all overweight, and then we start doing competitions, and burn down charts in order to lose some weight. I've seen that, actually, one of my customers. And then, number 10, follow-up. 
We have this small nifty thing called the daily meeting, 50 minutes every day. Maybe a good moment to say, what about the yellow jackets? Is anyone working on the yellow jackets thing? The safety jackets, you know, people interrupting. We're going to be more focused. We're trying that with perspective on Friday. Remember the jackets? Sometimes Scrum Master is like, Jesus Christ, buy some jackets so the Scrum Master shuts up. You're doing your job. <laughs> Congratulations, I like that. <laughs> so, okay, I started with these 10 ideas. Because of course, you know, it's got to be 10. Okay, if you write a blog post, it has to be 10 things you can do in order to improve your retrospectives. You, you see an article on Cosmopolitan and it reads something like, seven ways to make your girlfriend crazy, and you're like, seven? You gotta be kidding me, right? Uh, but if it's 10, oh my god, that's a good number, okay? <laughs> and then you have plus one for free if you click here and you subscribe a newsletter, <laughs> whatever. So it has to be 10. And then over time, I created this new brand, Improvement 21, and one day I was like, oh my god, it has to be 21 now. <laughs> so I basically, you know, stretched some of those 10 points. Uh, there's this white paper that you can, uh, you can download if you follow that link. Uh, there's a newsletter. Uh, we've sent like one newsletter in the whole year, so we're not spamming anyone. And you can unsubscribe later. I don't care. But it's for you. And there's a lot of information on these patterns, things you can try, uh, things you can do in order to improve your retrospectives. And that was the first half of my talk. So, kind of on time. But then, while I was working on fixing and managing to make better retrospectives, I realized that there was more than that. It's not only about improving a small part of the whole agile ecosystem, a small process, a small part, also in a team level. There's much more than that. When I started asking to my customers about how they were performing now that they had retrospectives on asteroids, okay, the super process for retrospectives, they are like, wow, they're going really, really better, but we bump into stuff that the team feels they cannot just solve on their own. And I was like, what kind of stuff? And we realized there's four domains that you can find improvement opportunities. Okay, and this is consultant talk. We don't talk about problems. We talk about improvement opportunities. So, improvement opportunities number one: change, change dynamics. Sometimes you have a great idea, and you're like, "Listen, guys, we should do unit testing. It's a good thing." And everybody's like, "Nah, that unit testing thing is a fad. It will go over." And then you start thinking, "I'm surrounded by idiots." Anyone been there? Anyone been like, you know, every, every single time I say that, someone in the audience goes like, yeah, that's me. <laughs> I'm surrounded by idiots. <laughs> Don't do that. I've been there for a long time. It, also, it only creates negative karma, negative thinking. That's called the attribution mistake. If you just think everyone around me are idiots, then you eventually will move somewhere else. Only to discover that, guess what? You are again surrounded by idiots. It's called human beings, okay? <laughs> so, you have to understand change dynamics in order to introduce change in companies. There's a lot of uh, discussion about this concept of if you can manage change. You can't manage change better than you manage a storm, for instance, no? You can, or, or a wave. You can surf a wave and you can make some positive actions out of a wave so you can see it coming and see something with it, do something with it. So there's a lot of things you have to ask leaders, as managers, as scrum masters, coach, people in agile teams, people, change agents of any kind. You have to learn about the dynamics of change. So there's this amazing book, Fearless Change. Jürgen Apollo wrote a small booklet that is available, I think, for free on PDF in several languages, How to Change the World, where he talks about the Management 3.0 uh, vision on change management, and there's much more. There's even, um, I have uh, uploaded in YouTube, you don't have to put your email or nothing, it's absolutely for free. There's a video that is called um, Hacking Culture for Change Management, and it has 21 tips on how to introduce change in companies, because you know it has to be 21 now. But it's practical tips, uh, practical tips. So there's a lot of things you can try, like communities of practice, like labs, like the Agile Corner, and I talk about the continuous integration screen, and I talk about the champion skeptic, and I talk about the guru on your side, and several things you can try in order to move change in your company. And that's not only about retrospectives. Someone, some people in your organization should be working continuously on driving that transformation and that change. Something we are doing in many companies is we create an impediment backlog. How cool is that? This is all the things we hate about how we work. And then we try experiments, like, hey, let's try this yellow jacket thing. So these are the next experiments we will try on the next sprint. These are the ones we're trying now. This is what we're trying right now in order to fix some problems. 
And then we try to evaluate and assess. And some of the experiments, they work. Oh, that's good. Some of them, ah, they kind of work, but we can improve them some way. And some of them are not working. And with the ones that we have to improve, or we have to maybe, I don't know, maybe it's not working at all, sometimes we keep trying. Sometimes we put them again in the impediment backlog, saying, OK, we've tried solving this. You know what? It's too hard. Let's try to solve something else. That's cool. Perfect. So here is a buffer for next experiment, how, what we should try. But another important thing, every single thing we improve, we publish in an improvement backlog. Because it's very, very important to market this thing. We, te we technical people, we are very, very bad at marketing. We should sell to the organization that all this time we're in the retrospective, painting on the walls. It's not actually lost time, there's a return on investment. And people like to see quick wins, small, low-hanging fruit, small things like, hey, this jacket thing is working, and the marketing guys are like, you know what, that's clever, we should try that. Okay, so this is something we are doing. We are also doing uh, transformation teams, like people that are 100% allocated to the transformation effort, so they are not like, oh my god, I don't have time for this agile transformation. We are doing the agile corner, we are doing agile safaris. This is something we imported from Google. Google does agile safaris. And some people in the company I was coaching was like, do we get to shop developers? I'm like, no, <laughs> no, 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 sorry, no. But we tour people from Sweden and from Germany, and we, you know, we go to Romania, and we go to Madrid and Barcelona and other places, and we show them the agile ecosystem. We show them teams doing dailies and doing retros, and we explain them the boards. And once they get the boards, oh my god, they love them. They are like, but everything is here. And you're like, that's what I'm trying to tell you. <laughs> You have all the information there. Come and see it, instead of asking for reports. So there's a lot of things you can uh, research in order to improve your change transformation. And then there's culture. Even if you bring the most nifty tools in the market to your company, if the culture is like, no, 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 don't try anything unless you have permission for the boss. No, 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 this might be signed by the vice president. No, 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 you have to go up or go out. This is the career path. If you have that kind of culture, it's going to be very difficult that you try to push improvement in that company. So you have to change the culture. In order to change the culture, you have to understand the culture. I think that one of the books that was most helpful for my practice as a consultant, as a coach, was Tribal Leadership, because it gives you a model. And all models are wrong, but some of them are useful. Jürgen Gapel says that. And this is a useful model, because it gives you an idea of how people talk, how people behave, and what's the transition, and how can they evolve, okay? And how many companies are organized according to their cultural levels. And of course, there's all, all the all the writings and the books about Edward Schein, and you have books like Delivering Happiness by Tony Shea, Good to Great by Jim Collins, or Maverick by Ricardo Stender. Those are amazing cultures that are broadcasting their culture. Google has a blog right now, Rework, and it's talking about how they are, they are creating teams and how they are forming those teams and the kind of practices they are introducing. And that's like, you know, a gold mine. Because that's like one of the most powerful companies at managing talent telling you what works, what doesn't work. So there should be people in your company devoted to reading those blogs and put them on practice and try to steal some of their ideas. For me, the, the revelation was the most important thing that you can do in order to change a culture is storytelling, telling stories. Because the stories are everywhere. For instance, you go to the coffee machine or you go to the water fountain and people are there telling stories about your company. Guess what? They are not usually the good ones. They are talking about, ah, oh, you know, this asshole that did this and this and this. Oh, you know, this boss who is clueless. Oh, you know, this employee who is, uh, uh, is, is absolutely waste. And they are always, you know, these bad stories, they tend to circulate in the veins of your company. Again, the parallelism between health and improvement. So you have to give some good food to your organism. You have to start pumping good stories into your company. You have to tell about this team that got, an, uh, you know, uh, that got a very, very happy client to write them a, a thank you letter, like I'm so happy with the product. You should pump that story into your culture. Then there's the people that, that gather on a Saturday and went to a conference and learned new things and brought them back. That's a good story to pump into your company. Nobody takes the time to actually tell those stories. And if you don't have good stories in your company, number one, you should worry about that. Number two, find them elsewhere. Tell stories about Google, tell stories about Zappos, tell stories about King, about Zynga, tell stories about Spotify, whatever. 
find those stories, pump those stories into, into your company, and try to make people identify these stories. Something I try with a lot of success right now, I'm going to publish another white paper on the newsletter about that, is mixing storytelling and impact mapping. What we do is we find a story where people are like super, super happy and, and proud of it. And we put it on the center and, I, and we are like, why did this story happen? And then there's a whole list of questions like, why here and not there? Why now and not the last year or in the next year? Why in this department? Why with this method? Why with this client? And then we try to figure out a lot of things about that story and then we move to the, to the who. Who was in favor of this initiative? Who helped? Who was against the initiative? Who was an impediment? Who made it possible? Who worked on it? Who didn't? So we start figuring out more things about that story and then we keep pulling and pulling and pulling. For instance, there was a bank that I was working with and we tried this exercise and there was a story that they were very, very proud about. It's a small group of change agents they wanted to go to an agile conference and the company said no. So they decided to go on their own time. They asked for holidays and they paid for the tickets themselves and they paid for the conference, for the conference themselves. When they came back, they started doing so many things that the company said, you know what? That was a wise investment. You are improving the company with the things you learn in this company. We are going to give you your holidays back. We are going to give you your money back. And that was a great moment. Everyone was like, oh my god, we did it. And the company was like, guess what? You are right. And we are going to act in order to correct a mistake. Everyone was so happy. And we were like, why did it happen here with these people, in this company, in this moment? Why not last year? So we started pulling, 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 pulling. And one of the things that happened, one of the things we found, is that a year before, they brought someone from the industry, some guru that was passing by, and he gave a talk at the company. And that was the place where these three people said, oh my god, that's a brilliant idea. There was 200 people that said, man, uh, this will never work here. But three guys. They say, you know what, I want to try that. And that was the sparking moment. If you focus on, oh yeah, sending people to conference, not paying for it, and then giving the money back, you try that again, you're like, come on, you're kidding me, right? The important thing was not the conference, the important thing was how the whole change process started. And we found a lot more other things that you can do in order to you know, uh, make these kind of stories possible in your culture. It's a nice exercise you can try with your groups. And there's more things, like tweaking the environment, like, like kudos system, like saying, hey, I like that. Hey, that was great. Amplifying the good, process, the good behaviors. Tweaking the environment is a story I love. There was this group of developers that were asked to do continuous integration. Please do continuous integration. How weird is that? <laughs> we are trying to convince our managers to set, you know, apps of Mavin Jenkins, whatever. And these guys, they were explicitly asked for it. And they were like, nah, we don't believe in that. It's not going to work here. So we set up the continuous integration environment for them and they were not using it. And we were like, dude, uh, the build has been broken for a week. Nobody's fixing the build. You are receiving emails that say that the build is broken. And they were like, oh, those emails, they were so annoying. We're filtering them. <laughs> <laughs> so we said, hey, let's try the screen thing. We have this screen and you can see the code in green if the, code, if the build is healthy and it's in red if the build is broken. We put that in the developer's site and they didn't react to that. And then I thought of another idea. And I moved the computer screen to a hallway where all the managers were passing by. <laughs> and you know, managers are not very intelligent, probably. We are not very intelligent. We don't know that, that much about technology. But we know that green, good. <laughs> red, bad. <laughs> and this was green yesterday. And today it's red. So there you see the managers like, tok, tok, tok. It's not fixing. <laughs> It wasn't like that, of course, it's a joke. But then suddenly some managers started like, why is the bill broken? And then developers started to worry a lot about the, the, the bill, okay? So sometimes tweaking the environment, moving things around, can make some changes in the culture. So we talked about retrospectives, we talked about driving change, we talked about influence in the culture, and there's three more dimensions and 10 minutes. So one dimension is people and teams. Even if you have a great process and you're like, hey, our culture is incredible. If you hire monkeys, then you are not going to have like amazing products. If you hire monkeys and you pay them with peanuts, you're not going to have amazing products. So you have to develop your people. How can you improve your people? Well, the most important thing is you need to invest in developing your people. How? Uh, well, you can buy training. That's very important, said the training seller. Um, <laughs> 
But the most important thing you can do is set structured time, like you have 5% time, 10% time, 15% time. How much can I invest on my team? That's a valid question you should do in your company. Hey, I'm not saying it's much or it's more or less, but let's start with a figure. How about 5%? 5% is one full afternoon every, four, every two weeks. So you can start doing labs, for instance, which is a practice that I love. Every two weeks, we will spend a full afternoon, four hours, five hours, all together doing a lab. And the lab is not only technical. We can have communication labs. We can have retrospective labs. We can have, I don't know, story mapping and user story maps. So we can have culture labs. And of course, someone can read a book and say, hey, you know, this, this book I found, it's called something like Clean Code. Rat shit. <laughs> okay, tell us about it. Let's let's have this person presenting clean code for four hours or five hours and making some exercise. So we can do kata. So we can do uh, I don't know. We can set environments. We can do sparks. with a lot of stuff we can do. But one afternoon every two weeks, five percent time. Some people are like, oh no, my God, that's too much. And you're like, well, as a company that relays on the talent and the knowledge of their employees, how less that five percent do you want to invest? And then my ears are like, mm, well, 5% is right, but not a full afternoon. That's too much. Maybe one minute here, and then two minutes there. Maybe in the bathroom break. <laughs> and you're like, no, you don't learn that way. You need some structured time, some structured space. And they're like, yeah, you know what, you're right, but right now we are so busy. And you're like, oh, I see. So let me ask you, what was the last time in the, four, in the last 40 years that we were not so busy? So I can, <laughs> I can predict when's the next time that we are not going to be busy in order to learn. Um, yes, but there's this project that is going to get delayed. That's, that's not true. I mean, if you have one afternoon every two weeks, that's like one day every month. In a 12-month project, and, I, and you shouldn't be doing projects, you, just, you listen to, to Vasco, in a 12-month project, that means you get delayed, a delay of 12 days. You know what? Don't try to steal from me. I've been in jail. <laughs> If you plan for a 12-month project and you get a delay of 12 days, you are going to get celebrated so big. You're going to get the red carpet, you're going to get the music band, you're going to get the confetti falling from the top of the building, you're going to get the slaves saying, remember, you're immortal, remember, you're immortal. Remember. <laughs> Come on, 12 days, you got to be kidding me, right? <laughs> Is that the problem? So yeah, labs are great, and it's very, very easy to defend lab time. It's one of the things you can do. And it's not only labs. You can have uh, communities of practice or guilds, and you can have exploration days, AKA hackathons, FedEx days, and you can have, even if you don't have the labs, you can pair. Every single time you have pairing, you have two people working together, it's, uh, someone is learning, maybe both of them. And at the same time, another person in the company is looking at an empty computer saying, hmm, that is not productive. <laughs> but you should be over that. I mean, we all know that it is not about how many keystrokes per hour. If you still think that way, you should rethink your company. Then you have, for instance, free electrons, which is get your best people, and instead of burying them down in the worst project, set them free. Set your best people free. You don't have no assignments, no projects, no team. You are free to float around and ask, can I help somewhere? That's very good because they, tend, they, they get to teach other people, to help other people, to coach other people. And they are available in the places where they are most needed at every given moment on real time. So there's a lot of practices. Or for instance, let's surfing. Send some of your people to work at another company and bring them back. And then they can learn some things. There are companies exchanging people so they can learn. And I'm doing that with my customers. When I find two great customers that are not in the same market, like for instance, one customer is a software consultancy and the other one is running an online, I don't know, hotel booking service, I put them in contact and they exchange people. And then suddenly there's a common initiative and then they exchange some developers and they all learn things. So that's cool. It's also a way of learning. So, I got two more, which is processes and products, and I'm finishing. Bad process. Okay, bad process is probably one of the first things you will try to fix in retrospectives. You see the scrum process, or you see the whole software development process, and you, you spot a lot of waste, starting with technical debt. This is my metaphor for legacy code. Okay. Uh, that's probably you sitting on top of a mountain of legacy code. Smelly, stinky legacy code. Okay. So how do we fix process? Well, there's a lot of stuff too much to cover in a, in, a, in a talk, that you can have people understanding lean, agile, 
you can have people understanding theory of constraints like bottlenecks and how what can you do with bottlenecks you can start defining what's value in your company who's the customer you will be amazed by how many of my customers worldwide when I talk to them and I say value is what are client values value is the problem of the customer we are solving somebody will always raise their hand and say but who's the customer I'm like dude really I mean if you are in Starbucks who's the customer everyone knows in the Starbucks everyone in the company says everything in this company goes to the barista, the one that is preparing the coffee. Everything in this company is here in order to make the barista more successful because he's a touch point with the customer. My hint, my clue in order to find who your customer is, he's not in the payroll of your company. He's not the human resource uh, manager. He's not the CEO. Your customer is not the warehouse manager. Those are things you have in the company and you will have to eventually develop some software for them. But even in that software for the warehouse, I have to think about the final customer. How can we do this software in a way that improves the customer experience? Most of the time, companies are doing bad software, bad products that screw the customers because that's what the manager wanted, the developer thought it was easier, but they just forget about the whole customer thing. So this is one of the best things you can do in order to improve your processes. Like things I'm doing at my customers, we do value stream mapping workshops. We put everyone together from concept to cash, from the receipt of the order to the receipt of the payment. So every single step, and we try to figure out where are the bottlenecks, where are the queues, how long are things taking, how much waste we can remove from that process. Everyone should know in which value stream is working and who's the customer of that value stream. Every value stream in the company should have an owner. An owner is not the one who decides, but it's one that keeps the conversation around the value stream moving. And that's super important, I think so. Uh, five Y analysis workshops, scum works, tax forces, cross-functional teams. There's a lot of things you can do to improve your process. And then, after all this talk, you have the last but not least problem, which is maybe you are doing stupid products. Like, for instance, the amazing bread gloves that turn anything into a sandwich. And you're like, okay, maybe the team that did this was the most agile team ever. They are doing dailies and retrospective and unit testing and continuous integration. And they are doing Kanban boards and they are doing uh, the TDD. They're doing a stupid product on time and the budget, with all the features. <laughs> or for instance, I have more examples, like the amazing watermelon transporter. How cool is that? <laughs> Stupid product. Or you have these amazing band for all the remotes. So you, have, you can get the remote of the TV, and then the remote of the Apple TV, and then the remote of the music, whatever. Or for instance, that's, I love this one, woman's toothpaste. Because you know, women, they need their own toothpaste. So they can pay for the pink tax. You know what's the pink tax, right? You buy a razor, it's blue, it's cheap, it's pink, it costs a kidney. <laughs> That's the pink, it's the same razor <laughs> from the same vendor. It's a scam. Um, or amazing... <laughs> Self-explanatory, yeah? American, American thing, right? <laughs> Or you have Clippy, the office assistant. Since you are writing a suicide letter, you want some help, fuck off. <laughs> we hated this thing, okay? But someone in Microsoft was like, no, you don't understand. This is actually great. You will eventually love it. And you're like, no, I won't. <laughs> but yeah, okay, great product. Maybe the Clippy team was the most agile team ever. We don't know. You know, Microsoft, they were the ones that published the first Scrum books, okay? So maybe this was the original Scrum team, but they were doing something stupid. And that's something you can, you can improve. Or for instance, wrong products, iPhone 7. <laughs> Where's the headphone jack? Fuck you up. Or for instance, you can have a wrong product. Like the Kodak Color 36 film exposures, 200 ASA film, which was the best film in the planet. 83% of the sales in a given moment. And guess what? Kodak, they went bankrupt. Because they were doing a product that they were, in, they were in love with. It was so amazing. But the technology was moving. They invented digital photography. They invented the first megapixel chipset. But they were like, nah, you know what? We are a film company. We're not going to play catch with the Japanese people anymore. 
famous last words. They were so in love with the product that they forgot about the customer. The customer didn't want to take a picture, then wait for six months until he finished the film roll so he could develop it and see the picture and say, oh my god, it was wow, so I have to take it again, no I can't. So that was a problem, and they were not looking at customer problems. They were looking at the beautiful, amazing product they were in love with. So don't turn your company into Mac Agile, okay? Where you deliver twice the crap, twice as fast, okay? <laughs> don't let that be your motto. Don't, don't, don't do bad products, stupid products that are unhealthy, that are not used, that are waste, only that we are doing them very, very fast and in a very efficient way. So this is highly inefficient. Don't turn your company into Mac Agile. So things you can do, care about the problem of your customers. Stop talking about your amazing drill machine. Your customer problem is they want to put a, 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 you know, a picture on the board, on the wall. And maybe you can do that with a drill machine, maybe you can do that with tape, uh, or maybe you can do that with glue. I don't know, there's many solutions. Instead of looking at your product and falling in love with your product, fall in love with your customer and treat anything you believe you know about your customer, treat that as an assumption. That's lean startup, that's design thinking, that's customer centricity. The idea of, we don't know, let's try, and let's bring the customer into the whole conversation. You know what? You ask Ken, uh, Ken Beck, you ask Alistair Coburn, and you tell them, Ken, Alistair, what was Agile all about in the beginning? And they are like, you know what? It was about bringing the customer and the developers together. That was it. That was it. And then uh, all of things came by, what they call barnacles, you know, this thing of mouse, things that get attached to the body of the, bo of the boat. And some barnacles might be nice, you can put them on rice and they are delicious, but if you get too many, then you can't sail. You are good sailors, you should know about this metaphor. So, a whole vision of improvement. Improvement is not only about running retrospectives, it's also about improving your culture. It's about improving your people and your teams. It's about improving collaboration between people. Maybe you have great people, but they don't know about how to collaborate together. It's about improving your process. It's about improving your products. And in each of these fields, there's an amazing amount of stuff you can learn and you can try in order to make your companies more successful. And instead of trying to build a plan and a project for improvement, you should run small improvement cycles, shortening the feedback cycle, no estimates. Um, it's the same idea. Instead of thinking about what am I going to improve from here to 2019, think about your most, e most noticeable and, and I, I know, painful problem right now. And do something about that. Even if you don't solve it completely, even if you just you know, solve a little bit, that's an improvement. I was talking to a bank earlier in a video conference and I'm finishing, and I was telling them, you know what, the problem is that some people come to your bank and they say, you should form Cross-functional teams, two pizzas. What's two pizzas? There are seven people. Seven plus minus two. And these seven people, they should be able to ship a product from the beginning to the end in your bank. And they look at you are like, what? We have 500 systems. 500. Well, you shouldn't. Ah, okay, thank you. So we should die, right? Yeah, you are evil and you should disappear from the surface of the earth so where the rest of us can be agile. That's not an answer for a bank. So what I tell them instead is if you are taking like a whole year to ship something out of the building, and then suddenly we're able to ship something out of the building every six months, that's a hundred percent improvement. And then if we can do every four months, that's amazing. And then if we can do something every three months, that's awesome. And then we can bring it down and down and down, and maybe a bank will never be able to be faster than three or two months, because they have such complex environments. That's not websites. Many of the original Agile teams look at the technology they were using, and look at the product they were developing. There were four people doing a website. You cannot directly translate that to a project where you need 57 people at, le at the least number because there's specialization and dependencies and a lot of things. You're not ever going to build a space probe with five people. Right now it's not possible. You will need a lot of people. Okay? And then you need different uh, approaches. And I use the Scrum principles and the patterns, but what I do the most is what can we improve? How can we go faster from one year to six months? That's improvement. And then let's keep going. Small cycles of improvement. My last words, the most important thing is to develop a habit. There's an amazing book which is called The Power of Habit, where it says that habits start with a cue, something that triggers the habit. And then there's a behavior that will give you a reward. And that reward you will crave. 
because that's an evolutionary thing. Okay, you, the things that uh, when you find some food and you eat it, you feel good in order to keep you finding more food. So it, we are very primal still. Um, there's ways that we can switch these uh, these behaviors in this in this form that when we see the the, the cue, we have a different behavior and different reward, and then we can uh, develop healthier habits instead of bad habits. It's complex, it requires a lot of work, it's hard, and it's probably a lifetime effort. Like for instance, if you've been a smoker, you will ever, you will always be a smoker. You will, you, I will be always on risk on starting again, because there's a reception in my brain that is very, very sensible to nicotine, and I need to know that. And companies in the same way, they need to know about their addictions, their addictions to estimates and deadlines and projects and budgets and moving people around. And then they have to find new things they can do when they have this problem where a team cannot go on because they need an analyze and then I get an analyze here and put them there. Ah, and I get the reward that there's not a problem anymore. Well, that's a bad habit. So we need to develop a good habit instead. And my final words, the most important thing, culture. My last word is, uh, I should be finishing. This is Morihei Ueshiba. This is the creator of, or this should be, or it's intended to be the creator of IQ, a martial art I've been practicing for the last six, eight years. And Morihei Ueshiba said, life is growth. If we don't grow, if we don't learn, we are as good as dead. And I believe in those words. And then you also have Lao Tzu, the creator of the, La, the Tao Te Ching. If you realize, he looks a lot like Morihei Ueshiba, right? <laughs> It could be like, you know, separated at birth, but of course this is Moriyama Yeshiva, he has the IQ of Kanji, and this is Lao Tzu, he has this Tao, uh, the yin yang symbol. But did you know these Japanese people, when they go older and they go wise, they all look like similar to each other. And Lao Tzu said that a leader is better when he's not noticed. When the work is done, everyone will say, we'll do, we did it ourselves. It will be invisible, okay? And in the same sense, uh, your job is not to be the ones that improve your companies. Your job is to awake the giant that is your company, awake the people at your company and make them all want to improve your company. So your job is not to improve the process, your job is to tell everyone, hey guys, imagine how great we will be if we improve the process. Talk to everyone, pump these amazing stories so people have the craving of improving and trying and living in a better world. And that's not extra job, that's your job. Okay? Thank you so much. That was Thank you. Do we have any time? questions for Anke? Yes, we have time for like two questions. Okay. Anke, do you have a question for the audience? <laughs> You tired? <laughs> no, thank you so much. Oh, there's a question there. Yeah. Everybody's looking forward for the closing ceremony happening in a while. Given your passion about certifications, <laughs> um, some hints or suggestions about assembling a scrum team or an agile team. Suggestions in order to, to assign a scrum team or an agile team? It's a, assembly. Um, you know, cross-functionality is not the goal. Cross-functionality is a solution to a problem, as anything in scrum. Why do we do dailies? Dailies is a solution to a problem. The dailies sol uh, solves three problems, which is synchronization between the team, uh, up update of the project information, and early detection of impediments. And then daily is a solution to that problem. Cross-functional team is a solution to a problem. What's the problem? Dependency. So first of all, we should be working on having as few dependencies as possible, okay? When I work in very, very complex environment, we are going through the, uh, what I could call, it's a little bit, you know, rough, but it's something closer to the skunk works than the scrum cross-functional team. Skunk works is this thing that Lockheed Martin did when they had a very, very critical project and they, you know, it was death or life for the company. Then they got together everything they needed in order to build a project. We need engine people, bring them on. We need uh, engineers, bring them on. We need electronics people, bring them on. We need project managers, we need managers, okay, bring them on. We have everyone in the room? Yeah, they locked the room. And everyone's like, open up! And they're like, no! 
<laughs> you will be confined there until you finish the project. And they look at each other and they are like, guess what? In this room, we have everything we need in order to build the project. So that would be my starting point. If you have some initiative, some project, some product, something you need to change, like for instance, a migration of a legacy, try to bring together as much people as possible that, uh, in order to, not as much as possible, uh, enough people that you have no or at, uh, as few as possible external dependencies. And then sort it out, because it will, it will look different in every, uh, every company. My idea will be try to have uh, teams that are as independent as possible, like each team should be able to push features into production. And that's what Spotify tells you, but they also tell you, well, this is what we'd like, this is not exactly where we are, that's what we are working on. Okay, so have that in mind, figure it out when you see the people, but the most important thing is get rid of dependencies. That will be the starting point. Thank you so much. I will talk to you. Thank you.